All right, well, let's begin with prayer, and we'll, we'll start in earnest. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, and uh, Lord, though our numbers be small, we pray for those that are not here, uh, whether in doctor appointments, having fun traveling, um, recovering from a, a fall, or doing we only know what. We pray, Lord, that you be with all of them in their various uh, situations and uh, be with them in, in your your spirit. Give them your blessings and uh, assure them, Lord, of your great and wondrous promises, the promises that we are always being renewed in as we study your word. Uh, help us this day as we uh, read a couple stories here from Mark's gospel and um, help to Help us to learn how to uh, read your word, uh, to have the, the tools, the questions to ask, to be able to get the most from it, or at least to get something from it, and to know, Lord, that your Holy Spirit is, is the ultimate guide in all of these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. Um, last time I handed out at the end of the class, but I can hand it out at the beginning if we need it. Uh, Mark five twenty one through forty three. Do I need to hand it out? No, nope, I have. Okay, it's a one one pager. Uh, no notes on it. And then I'm gonna hand out this uh, half page thing. Um, if you're one of those people that likes Bible bookmarks, it could be like a Bible bookmark. And um, it's not my own, and I don't even remember where I got it. There's just one. Yep, it's just a it's a quarter or a half sheet. Are there two there? Uh, yeah, there's two. Okay. 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 I have seven of them. I have more than enough. Yeah. Oh, sorry. They but they stuck they stuck together, and I thought there were more. Um, and this again, it's not my own, but it's it's pretty helpful to me because. One of the struggles we have when reading the Bible is we may not know where to begin, and without a approach, without a um, guide or direction, sometimes, again, it's, it's overwhelming. Uh, you always need to know, you're never going to read the Bible and know everything. In fact, the Bible's not really even that kind of a book. It's not about knowing everything. Again, this is the, the living Word of God. Um, and we come to it, and God meets us in it. Uh, it is his word, and the Holy Spirit is at work in us. And so um, I, I view it more as, as the, the Bible is a part of our relationship with God. We don't have conversations with other people um, and say, oh, well, I know exactly what they're going to say. I, I don't need to talk to those people. Um, if, if that's your attitude, you probably lead a pretty dismal and lonely life. Um, we, we talk to people because it's part of our relationship. Even if they say the same thing, uh, and, and we know that, uh, it is part of a, a caring relationship that we, we want to hear them. They, they want to say something. We want to be there for that. Um, and, and so with God's word, we're not even coming to it uh, to, quote unquote, get stuff out of it. We're coming because God is speaking. Um, it's his word. How many people... Uh, do we run into and they're like, oh, God just isn't speaking to me anymore. Like, I'm, I'm trying to hear his voice. Um, L Lutherans and, and I think, uh, Catherine, you'd say Catholics too generally don't approach God that way. Um, he has spoken. If, he's, if we don't hear him, maybe it's not because he's not speaking. It's because we're not listening. And um, his, his word is not a word simply that was given to us long ago and, and you know, do, doesn't have any more significance or relevance. It's always relevant because it is his word. So um, the way that we come to his word is important. Today, most of the time, people just come to it and uh, what does this mean for me today? What does this mean? And I... I hesitate when people say that's why they read the Bible, not because there isn't a word for them today, but because that sort of is further on down the line. Um, if you imagine a train is coming, that's sort of the caboose at the end. Um, if that's the only thing you see in the train, you're missing how the train is moving in the first place, what's powering the train, and then all of the stuff that the train is carrying. Um, it's, it's important. And so this little guide, I think, is immensely important for helping us 
slowly, and, and again, I, I do that, slowly read through scripture. We're, we're not in a hurry. Um, th- this is God's word, and, and it all is. Uh, we, we have our whole lifetime to, to read it. We don't need to rush things. But um, when you read it slowly, it, it opens deeper, I think, and you see more of it. So um, there's seven arrows of Bible reading in this little guide. The, the first is, what does this passage say? And so the arrow's like, you go back and, you know, can, can you kind of summarize it? Do you understand what's going on? The next question, what did, it, what did this passage mean to its original audience? Um, that, that one's always going to be a little bit harder and more difficult. One where we struggle because we would say, well, I, I don't know. Um, and so you usually have to use more tools to help you. It's okay to use tools in, in reading the Bible. There are things like Bible dictionaries, Bibles with commentaries. There are uh, teachers, people that know more than you. Don't, don't be afraid to use those kinds of resources. But um, it is an important step. And so if it slows you down, don't just uh, skip over it. I, I want to get to the point. The, this is saying you, you'll miss the point if you miss some of these steps. Okay, so after what did it mean to its original audience, what does the passage tell us about God? So the arrow pointing upward. What does it tell us about God? Then what does it tell us about, about man? That is about, about us. Um, that's an important part of it too. How does this passage change the way I relate to people? What does this passage demand of me? And then how does this passage prompt me to pray, which is a wonderful way to end because it sort of closes the loop. This is God's word to us, but it should feed our prayer life. Um, The Psalms are a, a big example of that, that the book of Psalms are in a sense, God's word, uh, not in a sense, they are God's, it is God's word, but they're prayers of, of people. Um, and when you read through them, they're very real and honest and open and um, say things sometimes that we might be afraid or you know, embarrassed or ashamed to say, um, like, where are you, O God? Uh, well, I shouldn't ask that because I know where God is. He's everywhere. But when you're going through junk stuff we have those feelings and the psalmist prays that it, it's okay to to pray that um and so all of these bible readings they aren't just god speaking to us then they help to give us words to speak to god as we've learned more about him we know who he is we know what it is that we can ask for of him we know what it is that he wants to do we learn more about ourselves. We know more about what we need from him. Um, so it all sort of is building together so that then we talk back to God. We, we converse with him. Um, and so you can kind of use this as a guide. Uh, another way to help you is you, you read through scripture. But um, the, the first and the place where it begins is read, read, this, read the section, read the passage, and then you're trying to just summarize it. So what does this passage say? Okay, can, um, I, can I... You may. In my research... Yeah. In my researching... Yeah. I came across one... Um, it was from the Go- uh, Gospel Transformation Bible, mm-hmm. which is a, a, a... It gives footnotes. Yeah, yeah. Like yep. Anyway, this one person who wrote in mm-hmm. Mark, what mm-hmm. commentated, mm-hmm. I thought it kind of takes us back to the previous mm-hmm. saving in the boat. In the mm-hmm, story. mm-hmm. If I could just read part of what he said, I have, I did make copies. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you can pass them around. One, two, three. It's at the mm-hmm. top of the page. Uh-huh. Okay. Thank you. I just want to read it. Thus, it's, it's quick, but uh-huh. it's 435 uh, through 543, mm-hmm. which is the calming of the sea, and then mm-hmm. through the end of the, mm-hmm. of the chapter 5. Jesus continues to display his expanding range of power in every sphere of creation. Power over the laws and forces of nature, Mm -hmm. power over the spiritual and demonic world, Mm -hmm. and the power over human illness and death. Mm -hmm. Jesus is not merely a a political messiah along the lines of the Vatican king. Rather, this messiah is God, the eternal son, and the gifts and Bible verses Mm -hmm. that you can look up. He is Yahweh, come in the flesh, it is crucial to realize this, since only God has the power to deliver and to save from the brokenness of our world and the bondage of sinful rebellion against him. 
and then it is a great source of encouragement for followers of Jesus to remember who they serve, the triune creator of this universe, the power of the eternal sun protects and guides with utter reality, reliability, even in great stress. Anyway, so mm -hmm. just I just thought that was kind of summing and, mm -hmm. and drawing the previous lesson mm -hmm. to this. I mean, the, yeah. kind of the three ways, yep. power over the laws of nature, over this uh, spiritual and demonic world, mm -hmm. and power over human illness and death. Yep, and you'll note that that little um, three-paragraph thing, the way that it, it develops is sort of along these lines, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. It's first trying to understand what's what's going on in this story, and then it, it talks about, you know, in, in big... In bird's eye view, so the previous stories were about a miracle where Jesus has power over nature, and then power over the spiritual world, and now this is power over human illness and death. So it's just it's it's giving you the bird's eye view. Here's what's going on, and then it's it's connecting this to Jesus's mission and understanding who he is. So what does this passage tell us about God? Um, and then it moves into that third paragraph. What's What's this going to mean for us? Um, so followers of Jesus, that's, that's us. So uh, it's, 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 it's good to see that happen in other people and how they kind of do it. Because again, um, I, I, I don't really disagree with anything here, but you see that it got, it came to that, it comes to that conclusion by first understanding what's going on in the, in the reading understanding how that fits in in the big picture of the Bible, what it says about God, and then, well, who, who are we? And who are, who are these followers of Jesus? What is it going to mean for us that Jesus has, you know, this identity? Um, and, and there's great comfort in that for us. Um, so, so, yeah, that's, that's a, a good, it's a good resource. Uh, it's a good use of some of those tools to help you, again, what, what is very overwhelming um, for people is making all these connections. So all of those Bible verses and whatnot um, that are in parentheses, you, you can go look them up and they, they probably won't tell you anything new, but you'll, you'll see, again, how it all connects, how the story is all there, how God is... Um, been working this this one plan and um, who Jesus is, but for for you, you you wouldn't have been able to find those verses maybe just on your own. Um, so again, tools are are helpful and it's good to be able to use those. Um, it's edifying sometimes to again slow slow down and and look all of those up or you know spend spend time doing that and again today uh you can use it in a in your own bible you can use a the computer uh there are bible websites and you can you know pretty quickly flip back and forth and all of those well i hope i i didn't want to interrupt but yeah. i didn't want to be uh, off track either. yeah no you're 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 not on you're not off track i just want to go back one step though i handed it out to you but we never read through the story together so we're just going to read through the story yeah. um and then we'll we'll come back but you're 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 doing the right things so i'm just going to read it straight from the handout mark 5 21 through 43 and when jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side a great crowd gathered about him and he was beside the sea then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus, by name, and seeing him, he fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, so that she may be made well and live. And he went with him. And a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. And there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for twelve years, who had suffered much under many physicians and had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard the reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if I touch even his garments, I will be made well. And immediately the flow of blood dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And Jesus, per pre perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, 
You see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house some who said, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. And he allowed no one to follow him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. They came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and Jesus saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. And when he had entered, he said to them, Why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. Taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha Kumi, which means little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl got up and began walking, for she was twelve years of age. And they were immediately overcome with amazement. And he strictly charged them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. So again, it's really quite lengthy. It's uh, over 20 verses here, um, which again, I, I sort of take the stories as they come. And again, your Bible's a, a pretty good reliable source. It's not always perfect because um, all of these decisions of how to break this up, it's done by an editor. It's it's done by a person. And so sometimes we may disagree like, oh, I would, I would break that up. But you can see here, um, how many stories is this? Is it one story? Or is it, is it two stories? There, there's, there's two things that are happening. And, and in a sense, they're distinct, um, two, two very different things. One, a story about a synagogue ruler, a guy named Jairus, um, and his daughter is sick. Turns out his daughter dies, and then Jesus will bring her back to life. That's, that's one full story. But then crammed here in the middle of it is this other distinct whole story of this woman uh, who has um, this this hemorrhaging, this bleeding, uh, and she hasn't been able to find any relief from this, but then touches Jesus and she's healed. And then the the conversation that happens afterwards with with Jesus um, that seems to be its whole a whole distinct story, but it's happening right in the middle of this story about Jairus. Um, so. Again, what's the passage say? What is it about? You want to kind of get your, your, your mind around that. And um, that's interesting, right? It's interesting that there's, there's not one story, but there's two stories, but it's, it's all kind of happening at once. Um, and again, just, just that detail, um, that, there's something unique about that. Mark has done this before. So when I'm thinking about what the passage says, I'm, I'm thinking about the passage as it, how it relates to Mark's whole gospel, because while we just separated it from the whole and like we're just taking this as its as its own thing, you have to know this is never its own thing. It's it's it is all part of a bigger story. But in order for us to have something to talk about, we have to kind of zoom in. But but then we never want to zoom in so closely that we forget the context. And again, Beverly was introducing us to some some way of thinking about this with a bigger context. So, um, you know, again, off the top of your head might be challenging, but you have your Bible open and you're just sort of scanning through. Um, is there a, ever a time when Mark told a story that kind of got interrupted and he told two stories in one? Anything you can recall? Mm -hmm. 
so the story about Jesus and his family. His family thought that he was out of his mind. And it's in chapter 3. So in my Bible, here's, here's an instance where the Bible doesn't help me at all with this. So my Bible has a heading for Jesus calling the 12 apostles. That's in Mark 3, 13. Okay. And then as a part of that, uh, it has the whole thing about Jesus choosing uh, the 12 apostles. And then verse 20, then he went home and the crowd gathered again so they could not even eat. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him for they were saying he's out of his mind. Well, frankly, that little paragraph has nothing to do. Well, it, 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 it seems like a different topic than the 12 apostles. So if I were to do the heading there, I probably would have separated this paragraph 13 through 19 from paragraph 20, um, just because they seem to be differently different. But then the next section after that is the scribes. And remember, this is when the scribes came and said, he's possessed by a demon. That's why he's doing this. Um, but we were left hanging because in verse 21, when the family heard that, they went to seize him for they're saying he's out of his mind. So it's like Mark is like on the verge of they're almost there to grab him. And then he like completely changes the story. And now we're hearing about the scribes and they're saying that he's, you know, he's possessed by a demon. He's, he's possessed by Beelzebul. Um, and then you had that whole story for 22, verse 22 through 30, and then 31 picks right back up with his mother and his brothers came and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. And so the story begins really in verse 20 about his family. They're wanting to take him out of there because they think he's crazy. But then that story was interrupted by the scribes and their verdict about Jesus. And then Mark gets back to his family coming to him. And then Jesus says, these guys aren't my family. The people who do God's will are my family, which in a sense relates back to those 12 apostles, the ones Jesus told. So this chapter is extremely narratively complex. Yeah. It's, it's like a layer after a layer. Um, because really, verse 13, Jesus choosing 12 apostles is all about the people who are, who, are, who Jesus calls to be near himself. Mm -hmm. That's in conflict with his family thinks they're the ones that are near Jesus. But by the end of the chapter, Jesus says, no, they, they don't know what I'm, you know, what business I'm about. Rather, the one who does the will of God, that is these, these disciples, these apostles, they're, they're really my family. So the point here is just that, um, again, I think Mark tells the story exactly as it happened. First, there was Jairus, and Jairus is about to get Jesus um, to go to his home, and they're on their way, but before they can even do that, he's, he's interrupted, and there's this other stuff that, that goes on. Um, but it's a complex story, and Mark's gospel, he, he writes these, these complex stories. It's hard to just dissect Jesus' ministry. Um, he's interrupted all the time. Things happen all the time, and he just deals with all of those things. Um, but what you also note, and uh, this is, I guess, how God, God worked his great plan, the things, the stories are all connected and related, um, and so while we might want, we might want to just follow one storyline and say, oh, well, let, let me just hear about Jesus's family. And I'm just going to ignore that, that paragraph about the scribes coming. I'm just going to ignore that. Um, you really miss something. You, you miss, you know, what, what Jesus is trying to say. And when we went over that, I kind of drew attention to that. The family thinks we control Jesus. He's, he's connected to us. We, we get to say who he is. And the scribes, now they have a different relationship to Jesus. They're the religious leaders and authorities, but they also have their own way of trying to control Jesus. And Jesus is saying, none, none of you get to control any of me. Rather, your job is to do God's will. 
And here, God's will is to listen to Jesus and to follow him. Um, so I'm going to come back to the story here. And is there any relationship, bet- other than they happened at the same time, um, is there any thing significant about how these stories of two different miracles connect to one another well both in both instances he said do not fear do not be afraid let okay. your faith mm-hmm. you. yeah 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 that's what i underlined too yeah that's so Key yeah, fear and faith in both of those mm-hmm. um, are, are are big things. And again, once once you kind of see that, the story that we uh, just read before that, Jesus calming the storm, all the disciples were afraid of that storm. Yeah. Sorry, I have the hiccups or something now. And um, they wake Jesus because they were afraid, and then Jesus calms the storm and Jesus's words to the disciples, it's it's about faith, right? Mm-hmm. Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? Um, so faith and fear are are very strong themes in this mm-hmm. section. What are the different things that people are afraid of? Well, I mean, on, on the previous story, they were afraid of the storm, but what were they really afraid of? Perishing death right they they were afraid that they were going to die out there don't you care about us we're perishing as they as they wake jesus up so so they're really afraid of death just it was how death was confronting them um is that any different here you look at verse 23 my little daughter is at the point of death right um and this woman while it doesn't say that she's at the point of death you you look at the description of her she's she's had this discharge for 12 years she's suffered she's spent everything she's no better rather she's growing worse um again those that have had a chronic because this is a chronic disease right those have had a chronic disease don't you feel like sometimes death would be a welcome antidote um because no, nothing anybody's doing is helping me. Uh, I'm only getting worse. So it, it doesn't say that she's at the point of death, but you could sort of take the details just to, you know, put together that story um, that, that she's she's basically, she's at her, her last thread. <laughs> there, there's nothing else that she can do. So, well, what about this Jesus guy? I've heard some things about him. You know, wh- why don't I try that? And, if I touch his garments, is verse 28, I will be made well. Um, that's that's what she wants. So um, 33, that brings out her fear and trembling. But do you notice, up until then, there was nothing that said specifically that she was afraid, right? Um, there's a description of her in verse 25. Verse 27, she hears the reports. Verse 28, if I would just touch him, I will be healed. Mm-hmm. Um, And then she does in verse 29. And then 30 is now Jesus. And he says, who did this? Who touched my garments? Verse 32, he looks around. Verse 33, she comes to him in fear and trembling. So that's interesting to me because where is her fear in the story? It's after she's already been healed, after she's already been made well, which should, again, remind you of the previous story, Jesus' disciples. Yes, they were afraid when the storm hit, but what happened after the storm ceased? Um, In chapter 4, verse... um, Verse 41... Uh, well, so verse 40, have, he said, Jesus said to them, why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And 41, the disciples, it says, they were filled with great fear and said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Um, they're, they're pretty afraid of Jesus. Um, the story after that, the, the demon-possessed man, 
Uh, they want Jesus to leave after he has performed this miracle. And uh, one of the reasons that they want to do it, I think, is because they're a little bit afraid of Jesus. This is a, a guy with tremendous power, um, and we don't, we don't know what to do. Is that what this woman is? Is her fear connected to that? Because she's not fearing death anymore, I don't think. She's made well. Um, she's been healed. Why, why, why fear and trembling? So there's fear there, but is it a different kind of fear? Yeah. Well, she did not ask permission to touch him. And so it's mm -hmm. like she's afraid that he's going to rebuke her and take it back or something. Yeah. You know, it's like, yeah. I feel great, but oh yeah. gosh, maybe I shouldn't have done that. Yeah. There, there might be fear of unworthiness. Mm -hmm. um, and she did, she, she did a no-no. And again, really, she, she did. So... This, this is a thing that you may or may not pick up on, but this would be part of what does this original passage mean? What does the passage mean to its original audience? When you hear the description about her, she's a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years. So she's unclean. She's unclean. Mm -hmm. So to the people in that day, that would communicate. Anytime you see blood or hear blood in the Old Testament, unless it's connected with the sacrifices, that's the only kind of good blood that, that heals or forgives or cleanses, any other contact with blood makes one unclean. Mm. So again, a woman, when she has her period, she, she's ceremonial unclean. Mm. A woman, when she gives birth and there's a discharge, she's ceremonially, ceremonially unclean. Whenever you come in contact with death um, and blood, the life force of a person, you're unclean. And what does it mean to be unclean in that society? You're ostracized. You're, you're led away to someplace else to live. For. You're contaminated. You're ostracized. You're cut off. Yeah. You're not to have contact with other people during that time because uncleanness is contagious. Uh, it, it spreads. Again, this is the way, this is the way they think about it and, and treat it. Um, we understand that with disease... And we would say that was probably a really smart thing in those days when they didn't understand diseases, that if you had a disease, you were cut off because that would, that would stop it from becoming a pandemic. But some of these other things, again, we, we don't understand and say, well, that's awfully unfair um, to, to do this to people. Um, nev nevertheless, these, these were the, the way that they lived their life. And so when you hear this, that she had this discharge for 12 years, um, again, we don't know, was it happening all the time? Were there, you know, is it like a, having, having a period that it came and it went, you know, wh whatever. But for 12 years, she, sh she shouldn't have been out among people. And the way that this is talking, she was experiencing it at that moment. Um, because it says immediately the flow of blood dried up and she realized it or she, she, she felt it in herself. Um, so she should not be in a place where the previous verse emphasized this. Jesus is there, verse 24, and a great crowd thronged about him. So in order, and then the disciples reaction, what do you mean who's touching you? There's, there's hundreds, hundreds of people here. So this woman and her fear, she really was extremely daring and, again, you know, broke the rules. Yeah. Um, but we've seen Jesus, he's okay with breaking the rules. Remember about the Sabbath, that great controversy that, you know, well, you're not supposed to heal somebody. And Jesus says, is it better to, to do good or to do evil on a Sabbath? And he's the Lord of the Sabbath, and he brought a, a bigger understanding. So, um, again, this woman doesn't know it, but if she's going to break the rules around somebody, Jesus was the right person to break the rules around yeah. because he, he got it. Um, yes, if you're healed on this day, you're brought back into the fold. That's, that's exactly what's going to happen. But you certainly don't want to miss her flow of blood means that she should not be anywhere near people. Um, and yet, here she, she came secretly into the crowd. Um, she, she would have been contaminating everybody, and um, that would have been a, a great thing. So 
she that could possibly be one of the things that she's afraid of. Uh, I, I did this for the wrong reasons, and now Jesus is going to take it back. It could have been even more severe um, in in their rules. Um, that this would be going on a different scale, but they had rules about holy places and unholy people. And if unholy people went into holy places, the consequence could even be death. Um, so the, the big four instance is the holy of holies, the most holy place in the temple. Only the high priest could enter there. If anybody else entered, they would be struck dead. And only on the day of atonement, only one day a year was the high priest allowed to enter in, and that was to perform the sacrifice on behalf of all of the people. Um, and so, again, there are rules about that. And Jesus is holy, whether, whether the people recognize it or not. Remember how he was addressed by one of the demons? You're the holy one of God. So here you go. Yeah, you have this woman doing this incredibly uh, amazing thing. So that's that's part of the intrigue about her story, um, that, that she should not be here. She should not approach Jesus. Um, but when you talked about the connection of, of fear and faith, it is her great faith in Jesus. And frankly, um, she had nowhere else to go. What, what have I got to lose? This doesn't work. Well, I'll just add it to the list of things that haven't worked, right? Um, not, not really a big deal. Okay, so fear and, and, and faith. We got that as, as a big theme. Um, did you see anything else that might connect the inside story and the outside story? There's actually a couple. Um, they might be a little bit more subtle. Story. The inside story and the outside story. So the outside story means the story of the uh, Jairus. Oh, in, in the text, his story is at the beginning, mm -hmm. his story is at the end. So it's on the outside, and then in the middle is the story about the woman. So that's what I mean by, oh. is there anything else that connects these two stories? Other than, again, like, cr chronology, it, it, it's just how it happened. Mm -hmm. But Mark, Mark is good at making bigger connections and there there are a couple other connections I think we want to see. Look at the identity of the people who need healing and descriptions of them. Verse 23 and verse 34. Mm hmm. So Jairus approaches and it's on behalf of his little daughter and Jesus will talk about the woman who had this flow of blood that was now healed. He calls her daughter. That's that's how he addresses her, um, which. One, you understand why Jairus would call his daughter his daughter. Well, that's that's their familial relationship, right? Why does Jesus call this strange woman daughter? That's a little bit more personal than just saying, hey, woman. Okay. <laughs> this made you up. But, I mean, it's more, she's now in the, his family. Mm -hmm. the, it's familiar. Yeah. Okay. So, again, th things are all connected. Chapter 3, verse 34, Jesus, looking at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. Now, granted, um, it didn't use the term daughter in, in that, but you see what Jesus is saying. He says, the real family, my real family, is a family of faith. And this woman uh, it, it yes, he could have just said woman. He could have said sister, um, but but daughter. Um, do you see the the love and tenderness there? Right. It's the same love and tenderness that Jairus had for his daughter. And do you see the panic in Jairus? Jairus he comes to Jesus and he's 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 bowing down before him. He's on his feet before Jesus and. He's doing that because he loves his daughter. He believes in Jesus, 
but he loves his daughter and has come on behalf of her. And so you see his tenderness for his daughter, but that's matched now by Jesus's tenderness for this woman. And again, think about her life the last 12 years. She's, she's been cut off from people, but, but here is, is Jesus like a father to a daughter mm -hmm. speaking to her um, and, and bringing her back into a family and in fact giving her a, a new family because she previously doesn't have a connection, a relationship with Jesus. She just is seek, seeking him out because she's heard stories about him. Um, but, but now Jesus calls her a daughter. And, um, so that activates a whole bunch of Bible stuff about the family of God. Right. Yeah. Um, and so again, to use some of the tools, you, you could look up things, uh, different words about, about family, son, daughter, child, children, um, children of God, brother in Christ, sister in Christ, and and you would see again how this it, it just all connects so well. Um, this the the tenderness that Jesus has for this woman, he has for all of us. Um, Behold, what manner of love the Father has lavished upon us that we should be called the children of God. She's a child of God. We we all are. Um, and how is it that we are children? By, by faith. Your faith has made you well. So again, verse 34 and 23 are, are parallel. My little daughters at the point of death, come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well. 34. Daughter, your faith has made you well. Right? Jesus is the one who makes all people well. Um, he says more to this woman. Um, I'm sort of skipping over it, but it is important. Go in peace. That's a big thing. Go in peace. Uh, be healed of your disease. Uh, well, I mean, she technically already was, but Jesus just confirms it and verifies it. Um, okay, so that's a big connection. So the daughter, there's daughters in both of this. One is a daughter of Jairus, but the other one is... Jesus. Jesus calls her his daughter, which again makes no sense biologically. This isn't his daughter, but it is a, a, a way of seeing Jesus's connections to us are, are different than just flesh and blood. Okay, the other one's pretty subtle, but you'll see it and you won't be able to unsee it once I point it out. Um, look at verse 25 and then look at verse 42 and tell me the connection. Yep, 25 and 42. Like, I'm not hiding something. This should be very, very obvious. About 12 years. 12 years. Yeah. 12 years. yeah. So she's had this discharge for 12 years. This, this, this man, Jairus, he's had his daughter for 12 years. Um, again, Mark doesn't say about, and so he's not just like using, like, because 10 would be an easy about number. Um, 12. Uh, and 12 one, just in this story, both of these people um, have significance of 12 in their life. So she's been ill for 12 years. This man has had this child in his life for 12 years and all of the, you know, the love. Uh, my daughter's 11, not yet 12. Um, and again, all, all of the love, all of the memories, um, you know, you're just on the verge of, you know, starting to see your little girl grow into a young woman and, you know, all, all of that stuff. And um, the future is so bright. And, you know, what is she going to be? What is she going to do with her life? Like you can start to see some of that happening. Um, and yet all of that's being taken away. She, she's at the point of death. Um, and for 12 years, this other woman, 
she has had no promise, no hope, no, you know, no nothing. And um, what this man has had is this, his little girl in his life for 12 years, this woman has had no one in her life for 12 years. Um, and there will be a dramatic reversal in both of their stories that she will now be well, and uh, this little girl who died will have life once more, and you know all of those things. So, um, so again, I, I don't necessarily know the significance, but it's just weird, right? Yeah. Weird coincidence, yeah. Yeah. but it bridges these two things together. So you can play games a little bit with well, twelve is is a pretty significant biblical number. Um, going back to the Old Testament, the 12 tribes of Israel. And so that stood for God's people as a whole. And then here, again, not so far away, was Jesus choosing 12? Why 12? Again, because that sort of symbolized God's people, um, apostles that would then, you know, be sent out. Um, yeah. So I, I don't know what to do really with 12 apostles, 12 years, but um, it's it's just interesting to see things like that. And yeah. um, it, it, it does draw stories kind of together. But more, uh, again, whether the 12 apostles, 12 years has anything to do with any, whether the two things have anything to do with one another, I do think there is 25, the woman having this disease for 12 years and the child being 12 years. Um, why, why else would Mark tell us? Who cares how old the, 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 the daughter was? Um, the fact that she was walking around, that's why you have to tell us she was 12 years of age? Well, she could have walked around at 5, 6, 8, 15. Um, but I think Mark, again, wants you to see Jesus at work in both of these um, people's lives. Okay, so all of that, I'm, I'm still just like, looking at the big picture passage, and I'm just asking the question, how do these two stories relate to one another? Because again, Mark could have separated them out to make it easier on our puny little brains, but he he, de he didn't, and I think he had good reason for keeping it together, because he's, he's doing all of this by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Um, this isn't just Mark being a smart guy, so what what can we gain from that? And so I think We've, we've at least drawn out three, three things. So the theme of faith and fear. Um, we've talked about the, the relationship, um, daughter. Uh, both of them are somebody's daughters, uh, and ultimately Jesus draws the, the greater connection. Uh, we talked about the 12-year thing, that she's had this illness for 12 years. The, the daughter herself was 12 years old. Um, and uh, these, these are all big things. Um, what, what might, you know, again, what might these things tell us about, about God? Again, he's, he's at work in, in ways that this, the story makes sense. Once you like look at it holistically, you might think, oh, why did Jesus get sidetracked um, by doing that? This little girl who was just sick, now she's dead. That's, that's not a good part of the story. Um, it looks like things are going well. And you note that he learns that the daughter has died after he's healed this, this woman. So it's like, yeah, it's nice you helped that woman, but she's been sick all of her life, and she's really a, a no-hope cause, but this little girl, she has such a great future, and now that was taken away because you stopped for this woman. Um, we might sometimes, in our own ways, play God out like this, right? Well, what does God have to do with me and my life? You know, I'm, I've, I've lived a good life. I've been blessed in many ways. There are people who are in much worse shape that need God more than me, and I couldn't possibly bother him. Um, what does a story like this say? Bother him. Bo bother him all you want, because he both cares about Jairus and his daughter and this woman. We think his attention is divided. He couldn't possibly, you know, handle... Yeah. He handled both of them pretty well, didn't he? In fact, he, he did it probably better than, than we, we would have handled this. Um, so, you know, th this is our God. He, he works in ways that are, are far above our limitations, and we have no need to, to limit him. If we need help, who, who are we to him? We're his son and daughter. He, he, he cares about us as tenderly and earnestly as 
that um, synagogue leader cared about his daughter because of who we are in him. Um, and and so yeah, in well then I, I jumped right, didn't I? Because who what it says about who God is also says something about us. You know, again, when you start with what does it say about me first, you, you can end up going a little bit astray. But when you ask, what does it say about God? It will always tell you something about who you are because God connects to us yeah. um, and wants to connect to us. And when we learn more about him, we will learn more about who we are in him. Um, so that's kind of an amazing thing. Um, okay, so I talked about that because I think that's probably the most interesting thing about this, the, the relationship of the two stories. Um, you do want to talk about the stories in detail, um, but again, Mark presents them as one story, not two stories, so you want to understand a little bit about that. Um, big picture thing, where is Jesus right now? I know geography is usually one of the things that's harder to keep track of. Mm -hmm. Do you remember what the last story was? And if not, open your Bible. It was Mark 5, chapter, uh, chapter 5, verse 1. Jesus just came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gerasenes. Do you remember where is that or what we said about this? It's east of the... Yeah, so I don't have a, my I don't have a large map with me, but it's really small. The Sea of Galilee. It's in northern Israel. This the region of the Gerasenes is in the southeast. Yeah, southeast. So uh, down further. Oh, right there. Yeah, right around there. Okay. It's in the it's in the southeast part. Um, where had Jesus been previously? On the northwest side of the Sea of Galilee. Look for Capernaum. That was, remember, his like main headquarters that he's going out from. Um, that's in the northern part of the Sea of Galilee. Okay. So he went on to the other side, which would have been the east or the southeast. And so that's where he is in chapter 5, verse 1. And then he casts out this legion of demons. And then what happened? The people wanted him to leave. And so at the end of verse 18, he gets back into the boat and then he departs. And so verse 21 is he's back, he crossed again in the boat to the other side. So where does that place him? Back basically to where he started. So he's, he's on the west side and the north side. We don't know exactly where. He could be back in the Capernaum area, but he's not on the east-southeast anymore. He's crossed back again to where he came from. So verse 5, 1 through 20, he was actually not in this area for very long. He really only came and did one thing. He cast out the demon from this man, and then they said, get out of here. We don't want you here. Said, go forth and teach. Mm -hmm. and, and to the man who wanted to follow with him and get in the boat with him, he said, no, stay behind. You tell him how much God has done for you and God's mercy. So that man was left behind to tell everybody. And we sort of, we, we're not going to go away again. But when we go away, we're going back to where Jesus had spent a lot of time. So... Who greeted him when he went to the Gerasenes? This crazy demon-possessed man greeted him. That was the first thing they, the disciples see. Who greets him now in verse 21 when he comes back to the other side of the sea? A great crowd. A great crowd gathered about him. So this is, again, just paying attention to context. The great crowd, these are Jewish people. So these are people that understand Jesus in light of like the Old Testament. So um, to her note here, the Davidic king, the Messiah as the Davidic king. They're looking for this, this conqueror, this powerful person. And Jesus, he shows great power. <laughs> He's done amazing things. So they're thinking this is only validating Jesus has to be this one. But Jesus really has an odd relationship with the crowd. He, he leaves the crowd. He had just been teaching them parables alongside the sea. He has a great crowd. If all he wanted was a crowd, 
he should stay there and the crowd would get bigger and bigger and bigger. But we remember in Mark's gospel, he doesn't just stay for the crowd. He, he goes off into the quiet places. He tries to get away from the crowd. Here the crowd is back. He didn't have a crowd in the Gerasenes. Just, just one person. Why? Because they weren't Jews. They're not waiting for the Messiah. They're not waiting for Jesus. Um, the only time the crowd came was after he exercised the demon and the crowd didn't come to learn about him. They came to get him out of there. So in a sense, he's coming back in verse 21 to his people and his people are there. Good things, right? They're, they're welcoming him. Um, he's beside the sea. So it's basically like we've returned to chapter four, verse one. Chapter four, verse one, again, he began to teach beside the sea and a very large crowd gathered about him. Um, th this, is, this is sort of where, uh, where he's been. Chapter three, verse seven, he withdrew his disciples to the sea and a great crowd followed from Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem and Idumea and beyond the Jordan from around Tyre and Sidon. When the great crowd all heard that, what, that he was doing, they came to him. So again, we're, we're going back to the thronging and the, and the huge crowd. And this is somewhat dangerous for Jesus because um, when the crowd gets out of control, they might have a mind of their own. So again, in, in keeping track of this, you, you could just, in your Bible, look for crowds in the gospel. And, and what does that tell you about Jesus? Like, who is the crowd? Where did they come from? What do they want? What do they want of Jesus? Um, and, and note that the crowd isn't the disciples, the, the apostles. They, 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 they come from the crowd, but the crowd is sort of like in a middle space. They're not the Jewish leaders that will reject him, but they're also not really the disciples that will drop everything to follow him. They're, they're just kind of waiting it out or something there. Um, and then Jairus is a synagogue ruler. Has Jesus been doing things with the synagogue in, in the gospel? Is, how does this relate? He's been teaching on Sundays. Yeah, he's on the, on the Sabbath. He's been teaching in synagogues on the Sabbath. Um, that's been a place of, you know, where he's been known. So you, you kind of have that. So when a ruler of a synagogue comes, again, Mark doesn't give us any detail. Was that one of the synagogues that he'd been teaching at before? So Jairus knew Jesus um, really, really well. Or was this just somebody who, again, happened to hear about Jesus? And it just so happens this guy was also a synagogue ruler, but it, it does it does connect back to Jesus's teaching. Um, but this, the synagogue really doesn't want Jesus for his teaching. He wants him for his healing. Mm -hmm. I want you to heal. So that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Jesus as a teacher, but his teaching, it, his word also heals and Jesus also heals. Um, yeah. So his encounter with Jesus, see, seeing him and falling at his feet, Again, have other people done that in Mark's gospel? You, you just sort of have to, you know, fall. You can do it with your eyes. You can scan quickly um, or you can use a Bible word search, a concordance. Um, has Have other people fallen at Jesus's feet? The answer is going to be yes. So, well, first example, the closest one, Mark chapter 5. The man with an unclean spirit, this, this demon, um, he, he falls at Jesus' feet, right? Verse, chapter 5, verse 6. When he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him. Okay, so that was there. Uh, any other instances? Again, you may not remember off the top of your head, but um, I'm just sort of jumping around. Um, I think of the leper, so I, I just happen to remember that. You, you, you could, again, search for it, and I might be missing one in between, but chapter 1, verse 40, a leper came to him, imploring him, and kneeling said to him. So kneeling is you're your falling on your feet before Jesus. And this man Jairus is falling at his feet. Well, again, keeping our story, verse 33, the woman 
at the end, after she heal is healed, she's going to fall down at his feet. Well, what does that position say about the people and what they think of Jesus? Do people just fall on their feet before other individuals? Is that a way that you greet somebody? Not, not you, it's not usually. Imploring type of situation. Mm-hmm. I mean, when you, you're, you're, it's like you're begging. Mm-hmm. I implore you to yeah. help me. Yeah, so. you, you're putting yourself at a person's mercy. Right. So it is a posture of, um, of a request. You, 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 you are showing that you have no demand. Um, there's no reason why this person needs to listen to you. You have no power over them. So it's a posture of of begging, of humility. pleading, humility. Yeah. Um, it's also a posture that recognizes power. So um, you think of kneeling before kings, yeah. kneeling before the, the, the real authorities. Again, get down on your knee, right? Yeah. Um, and so it, it is a recognition of status. It is begging, it is asking, it is pleading, it is saying, I'm nobody, um, and, and you don't have to do that. Uh, and you, you can kind of compare and contrast, this guy's a ruler of the synagogue. He's, he's pretty well-to-do. You don't get to be that kind of a person without being a person of great respect and authority in your community. I see we're out of time. I'm just going to finish this thought. Um, the woman, she, she's, a, she's, a, she's a nobody, but both of them fall at Jesus's feet. The man with demons, he was a nobody. He fell at Jesus's feet. The, the leper, he's a nobody. He falls at Jesus's feet. So again, Jesus welcomes all of us and none of us have a claim, but he has mercy on all. Um, and, and that's a powerful thing. Wow. Okay. So again, I, like I, 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 I wasn't putting you under the gun and you know you have to come up with bible verses and everything but when when you spend a little bit of time just looking at it and when we kind of did it out loud um again i don't even have all of my notes done i haven't spent time looking at this there might be other things as i spend time doing it that that i will see but you start to slow down you what does it mean in this story what's going on um and then when you do that all of the, you know, quote unquote insight yeah. will, will, will come. It, it will follow. There are things that we, we've pulled out of this, not without a lot of, you know, great resources, really. Mm-hmm. Um, just going slowly, thinking about it, rereading it, looking it over. Um, again, I, I drew your attention to a few things, yeah. but they were there in the, in the reading. We didn't find this anywhere else. It was, it was all really here, and we got there just by paying attention, asking questions like, oh, I wonder, you know, again, is there any other connection? (laughs) And you just read it and the Holy Spirit's at work as we do that. Okay, so two week break and then we'll come back in earnest um, and I will provide a commentary, but you've already started to unlock some of that and the people next time will be richer because of that. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I do thank you uh, as we have had time to, to look, to, to think, um, to talk about your word and, and these stories that we read. And we realize that these are much more than stories. This is your word. We are thankful that we have the opportunity to come before it. And just like some of these individuals in the story, we, we do fall before you. We fall on our knees before you and we call upon you for your mercy. Um, to to share that mercy with us, to have mercy on us. We don't even know the things to ask for, Lord. We don't even know the right things that we need. But nevertheless, you love us as your own, and you care for us with such great tenderness that you give us your blessings, you give us your gifts. And we pray, Lord, that um, in those times when we might have fear, we would be drawn to you in faith to see, Lord, that we can trust you in all things, to see your love and tenderness, your power and authority and uh, your gifts given to us that flow freely through you, through your life given on the cross uh, for us. We ask, Lord, that as we take a break here for another couple of weeks, that you would um, go with us, uh, protect us, watch over us, bless us, and bring us back again in, uh, in even greater numbers to hear your word and to grow through it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
All right, you survived. We'll get a t-shirt for you.